Occam's razor states that the simplest explanation is preferable to one that is more complex. Applying this principle to our exploration of the way of Adab will be helpful, perhaps even necessary, as we seek to live, not just understand, Adab. Can we synthesize our understanding of Adab into a single, concise directive, something that will immediately deepen receptivity and responsiveness? Can we find one word or one attitudinal shift or a particular breath that instantly puts us on a Dobbs path? Each of us will have to answer this question for ourselves because, as the Sufi saying goes, every blade of grass worships its creator in its own way. For me, the answer continues to be presence. The central imperative of the way of Adab in my life is, as a friend put it, be where your feet are. In the burgeoning world of spiritual awakening, there is widespread agreement that being in the moment is essential. While this dictum is no doubt a vital key, like so many wise aphorisms, it can be dulled through familiarity. Believing we understand what this means may curtail the ongoing inquiry needed to reveal new depths of meaning. Perhaps we can deepen our appreciation of being in the here and now by exploring it through the lens of the Arabic word huzur. In Sufism, Huzur conveys the idea of being fully present in the moment, both physically and mentally. But it also suggests something beyond present-centered awareness. Huzur intimates attunement to that formless, radiant emptiness, often referred to as the ground of being, or pure awareness, or divine consciousness. Huzur, then, could be seen as a state of being spiritually open and present, as well as fully mindful and embodied. Several considerations arise when we look at presence in this way. The first is that Huzur invites us into a subtle paradox. The idea of being present, let's call this staying steady in the moment zero of here and now, suggests a sort of concentration. That moment-by-moment -moment attentiveness may be fluid, but it does entail focusing. The spiritual dimension of presence, however, is expansive, open, not so much unfocused as unfixed. Our bodies are separated from the rest of the world by our skins. Likewise, our minds are contained within the limits of our experience, knowledge, and so on. But spirit is boundless. Spirit has no topography, no meridians and parallels with which to fix our position. So Huzur is a state of being both firmly rooted in moment zero, and completely unbound from any moment, a potent living paradox. Another consideration is that Huzur is transpersonal. No sharpness of intention, no amount of will or discipline can evoke it. We can, to some degree, will ourselves to be attentive and focused in a particular situation, but the spiritual dimension of Huzur is like an unbidden blessing, a grace that befalls us rather than something we achieve. So how do we avail ourselves of this state? We don't. It avails us. And yet, while this answer may be accurate, it's not very helpful. There must be something we can do. 
We can approach this conundrum by understanding the importance of capacity, a useful term here because it has several meanings. It means how much something can contain, as in, this tank has a 10-gallon capacity. It is also used in the sense of wherewithal, as in, we must increase the energy grid's capacity. And it can denote a particular role or function as she's here in an official capacity. We could then say that huzur may arise as we expand capacity by deepening receptiveness, as we develop relational wherewithal by refining our responsiveness, and as we grow in our roles as agents of kindness or truth or however we might formulate our personal ideals. We can consciously cultivate two of these progressions. For example, by practicing open listening, we can increase our capacity for understanding. By honing interpersonal skills such as acceptance, empathy, respect, and so on, we can refine our relational capacity. But the agency of the third progression, if it is to be true agency, invites a surrender to that of which we hope to be effective agents. The world is full of good people trying to do good things, but sometimes the good they wish to propagate is their version of good or their church's or political party's mandates of goodness. To be an agent of that goodness unlimited by human concepts, we must give up our limited notions of good and bad and invite that universal good to flow into the particular situation we find ourselves in. Our consciousness then functions as a liminal space encompassing both the specific circumstances of the moment and the timeless, formless source of everything. This is the mystic dimension of Huzur and the mystery at the heart of Adab. And this brings us to our final consideration of Huzur. Is there a practical way to encourage this liminality in our everyday lives? One way to approach this is by asking, when we experience presence, whose presence is this? The most direct and truthful answer would be, it's the presence of the one who asked that question. The ambiguity of that question suggests an interplay of self and something beyond. In classical Sufism, the answer might be, it's the presence of Allah. While that wouldn't be incorrect, it would be incomplete if it ignores the palpable reality of an individual bound to time and space seeking presence. Huzur then can be seen as interpresence, the conscious interplay of an individual with its nameless, formless source. For the practice of Huzur to be fully realized that source must be accessible to the seeker. It must be something they can name and whose qualities they love and serve, regardless of the fact that this source is essentially nameless and without quality or kind. Whether we construe this as Allah or the ground of being, as Brahma or the Godhead, as pure awareness or the great spirit, it is through our interplay with that source that the grace of Huzur arises. Then, in a way we may never understand, the way of Adam becomes how the presence of God, or whatever name we might choose, comes into and transforms our world.